Welcome to Story Talk, a roundtable discussion of a single story at a time. Story Talk is a production of One Week Critique, an Iowa based arts and education nonprofit that offers educational resources and editorial support to students and teachers of the literary arts. You can learn more about us and our programs or support our work by visiting our website, oneweekcritique.com. I'm Ingrid Wensler, One Week Critique's prose editor. Here, as usual, with our poetry editor, editors, Adam Alistair Ganey and Matthew Schmidt. Howdy. Hello. Today, we'll be discussing A Smile Outside the Night Stall, one of Yasunari Kawabata's short, short stories. Kawabata won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1968. He's known for his novels, especially Snow Country, The Master of Go, and Thousand Cranes, and a series of short, short stories, The Palm of the Hand Stories. Kawabata st said of those stories humbly, many writers in their youth write poetry. I, instead of poetry, wrote the palm of the hand stories. Among them are unreasonably fabricated pieces, but there are more than a few good ones that flowed from my pen naturally of their own accord. The poetic spirit of my young days lives on in them. For everyone's reference, we're working with a copy of the Palm of the Hand stories that's been translated from Japanese by Lane Dunlop and J. Martin Holman. This particular story, A Smile Outside the Night Stall, was translated by Lane Dunlop. It was published in Japanese in 1927 and in English in 1988. So that you can follow along, even if you haven't read this story, here are a few basic plot points to help get you situated. An unnamed narrator out on walk stops short, standing in front of a firecracker stand in an optician's stall. He notices, and as the story's Flanor narrator meticulously describes two vendors passing time together in the small space between their stalls. The glasses vendor, using a girl's short bamboo clog, frenetically scribbles characters in the dirt, never stopping to erase the characters he's written, just writing over them. The firecracker girl observes, it seems, sometimes understanding some of what the man's written, and reaches for the clog twice, but the man's too quick. After evading her the second time, the girl looks up, catches the narrator's eye, and involuntarily flashes the narrator a little smile. The narrator also involuntarily flashes her a little smile back. I think that covers the story's most basic plot points. Um, what do you think, Adam Matthew? Yeah, for sure, man. Uh, I think it's a really, I mean, it's a, a fairly tight short short. Um, I think we'll probably get into where it's expansive and speculative and all kinds of other things. But I think those are the, the moments that most need knowing to talk about it. Yeah, what do you mean by tight? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think that there's a real precision in terms of how everything is described, um, right? Like with the Kaobata or Kaobata's narrator in looking at what's going on manages to describe sort of everything that happens in a very brief moment in fairly significant detail. Right, like in some ways, I think about this story as being like sort of early David Foster Wallace. If you took a David Foster Wallace story and were like, listen, Dave, I've only got five to ten minutes to read about this guy crashing his car. Like, get the story down to that space. And it, I think it's got a lot of that sort of expansive, all the things that could be going on in a moment thing happening in a really dense space. Um, so that like, in some kind of literal sense to me, right? Like you're sort of pushing on the walls of this story without being able to like, there's just a lot in that little container. Right, I ask that just because it's tight but expansive yeah. in its descriptions. 
Yeah, um, I think I think we'll get into that a little more later too. Um, yeah. Let's um let's talk first about the perspective of the story. Um, who is the narrator? What do we learn about him through the story he tells? Any thoughts on that? <clears throat> I mean, the narrator seems to be a man with too much time on his hands. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, one, one could argue that, I guess. He's supposedly out walking around um, after he's left a particular building, which I really don't know what kind of building that is. So if anyone does, you know, enlighten me. I struggled to explain this one to myself. I tried Googling it, and yeah, I didn't so did come I. up with a good answer for it. So me your guess is as good as mine. All right, so he's out walking around some night, and he you know, apparently doesn't know what to do with himself uh, now that wherever he was is closed and he stops and watches these two people interact. Um, beyond that, you know, we don't get a whole lot of uh, information from him about himself mm -hmm. other than that he enjoys being speculative and imagining uh, what might happen in given situations, but also meticulous in considering how people act and move, mm. as well as um, how their feelings or perceptions might be affected by, say, him, a third party, watching those two people. Yeah, I think that in a purely... Um, guessing game kind of way, right? Um, I I get the sense personally about this narrator, although there's no reason other than the way he thinks to infer that, that the narrator might be a little bit older than the people that he's observing. Um, or, you know, even an oldish man. I think that's a guess that mm -hmm. I'm I'm attributing to him purely based on sort of stereotypes about the way that he's thinking about two young people that I think he thinks are flirting. And I think one of the things that operates about that within the context of the story is all of those, because he doesn't actually interact with these people absent the kind of smile and the the disdainful look that he gets, that he's just, and he's not being a peeping Tom, it's a public place, but he's staring at these people in a way that's intense and observant and maybe slightly creepy if you happen to be the people being observed in a private moment. Uh, but what he's doing is he's, you know, observing people in a private moment and there's something he's getting out of that watching and he's accidenting into it and then he's trying to sort of empathize through that. And I, I don't know that we know much more. I do want to say that, you know, want to break the fourth wall to say that the place, so the building that he leaves is H-A-K-U-H-I-N, Hakuhin in the translation. And the, the narrator describes it as a building that always closes at the same time. That's... That's sort of the, the sum of my guesses. And also that, like, we both, Matthew and I have both said speculative. Um, we're, we're not talking about speculative fiction in the sense of, like, genre-type fiction. We're saying that the narrator is speculating about the people because he isn't interacting with them directly. Yeah, I, th I think that's well put. Um, I think... We've paid a lot of attention in previous episodes of Story Talk to, to perspective and narration and, you know, what we can find out about the narrator as character in the story. And I mean, I think this, this narrator is an unusual one in that he's so much not on the page. Um, you know, I mean, I think even doing something like reading his age differently can really um, be a powerful lens and a changing one. Yeah. Um, I hadn't thought of that, and that does change how I look at how the story concludes, and, you know, um, 
I think most of what we end up learning about this narrator is through his speculations. They're, they're what we get access to, um, yeah. you know, his insights and the ways in which he thinks about other characters. Well, and what's significant, too, to your point, is it's a first, this is a first-person narrator, right? Mm -hmm. I stop short is the first sentence that we have. Um, so we're getting this individual's perspective, and maybe because the writing makes what, right, like if you're the firecracker girl and you're having a private moment, you're flirting with the eyeglasses guy or you're not flirting with the eyeglasses guy, like, and you turn and there's someone just like horrifyingly staring at your private moment, you might think all kinds of things about that person. You might think that they're creepy or you might feel caught out in doing something that you're mildly ashamed of or not. Or like whatever, right? There's this kind of expansive set of things that could be happening because we're close to that narrator, because that narrator is first person, um, right? Like this kind of interpretations that I want to give to him. Um, and I mean, honestly, I'm not 100 percent sure that this is a male narrator or that there's anything yeah, inferring no, I mean, that. It doesn't say. There are, say. I assume yeah. that it's a reader, but it is an assumption. There's nothing. But that's, yeah, it's me leaning into the fact that there's a sense of jealousy and a kind of heteronormative interpretation yeah. I'm putting on a story sure. that's written in Japan in 1927, right? Like, I, none of that's, um, none of that's a certainty. Um, so staying with the narrator a moment, um, and looking a little more closely at those descriptions of these other characters and his interpretations of their interaction together, um, do you trust the, the narrator's descriptions and interpretations? Um, like, do you take those observations as, you know, objective observations? Um, and, I mean, to go back to our usual question about narration, like, is, is this narrator reliable? No. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I think one thing that's interesting is uh, you've brought up this question about reliability of the narrator uh, a couple of different times. Yeah. And, you know, I'm less personally uh, interested in reliability, um, mostly because I'm interested in the characters in the story. And even if it's all a lie, that's all right with me. That being said, you know, he, the narrator goes to great lengths to describe uh, the positioning of the people. And by positioning, I mean their body positioning and exactly what they're doing. Like, he very specifically talks about what they're wearing, um, more specifically, the girl, than the glasses uh, vendor. Very, like, particular on the girl. And he'll mention things multiple times. Yeah. And to the point where it kind of takes me out of the story. And so I'm not upset that he, whether this is true or false yeah i'm more like kind of put off by such close scrutiny of like the a person moving their hands and then shifting their hands to a different position and i only say this because it stands out very clearly in this story because it's so short yeah if 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 it's in a different story a longer story I don't know. I might not remember it so well, depending on how long the description is. Yeah. Nonetheless, you know, to begin with, the story is, is mostly, I think, supposed to make us, you know, consider most of this situation that he's staring at to be accurate. And the final two paragraphs of the story are kind of whimsy in a certain respect in that he's imagining what could happen 
what these characters might be thinking, what they might do in the future, right? But, you know, having appended that on to this particular story, you know, it continues to push me away from, like, trusting the narrator, if that's what we want to call it. Yeah, I think that those are, you're giving me a lot of insight, not only into your thinking, Matthew, you're giving me some insight into my thinking, right? Like, you're, I promise I'll get to reliability, but, like, your, your earlier question about why do I think this is tight or how do I think it's tight is, I don't think this is a concise story. I think that, like, concision would be, like, what's the most efficient way that I could tell you the information within this story? In my mind, that's what it is. But I think tight being, like, how much information did I cram into five pages? Um, and I think this is a tight story. Like, it feels like nothing else is getting in this container. Um, and despite that, I mean, I think it's tight in the way that sort of, like, that old exercise of, like, you know, like, filling a jar with golf balls and going, like, is it full? And, like, yes, it's full. And then, like, filling it with sand and going, is it full? And you go, yeah, it's full. And then you fill it with water and that you can kind of percolate things into that space. If, when did you put golf balls in that? It's like a, a like children's science demonstration. But I get the sand and the water. All yeah. right, go on. Anyway, Sorry. my, my <laughs> point is that um, I think that this is a story that's sort of like it's got golf balls and maybe sand in it and like I still feel the room for water to percolate into the space a little bit um, and I, th I th think that's important insofar as right like this person is thinking right like it is a first person narrator to Ingrid's first question right like this person is thinking a lot about these little tiny details right the girl was intently reading. From the top down, the column of characters being written by the man. The bench on which she sat was low, and her clogs had teeth, so that her knees were raised and slightly parted. Right? Like, that's a lot of information about the way she's sitting, as well as speculation that she's sitting in that way because of her clogs, as opposed to that she's just sitting that way, and so on and so forth. And... Right, like, a little later on, we get this interesting thing, which I think feels like fact, but isn't. It's him, the narrator, speculating on something that's going on. I wasn't able to make out the characters inscribed by the clock. He's telling you what he can't see. Right? The man, not erasing a character once he had written it, but simply writing over it, kept doing one after the other. So, I mean, he's, he thinks he's got a good enough understanding of how the man's hand's moving that he knows that there's still characters being written down. Even so, the firecracker girl could probably read them. Now we're in total speculative world, right? Like, there's nothing particularly that we know that she is or isn't seeing. I mean, if I, like, you know, played that game where you, like, write something on someone's back with your finger or a letter at a time. Like, some people are really good at that. Some people aren't. Some people are good at that, but the person writing is writing too small or they're writing something squiggly or kind of in cursive. There's a lot of factors that... Or they're left-handed. Yeah, I mean, there's a million ways that this goes for people. I think that, like, I believe that the narrator believes what he's saying out of that. In the way that I believe lots of people believe what they're saying. But do I think that I should trust his interpretations? No. Like, like obviously not. Because he's, I think it gets clearer and he has better interpretations toward the end where he says, for instance, that like, I think he's making all these big speculations, kind of inferring that maybe she, like, is being seduced by this guy and that, he doesn't know if it's a good or a bad thing, but it would probably be better for her to just follow her father and her brother, whatever. Like, like once he gets there, I still believe he's doing that, but I think he's being more honest about not knowing in a way that all this other stuff that I think is describing his way of thinking and his sort of hyperlogical, analytical thought 
isn't doing, but also I think that hyperlogical analytical thought is deceptive in that like there's a lot of bullshit. Like there's a lot of bullshit seeping through the cracks, and that's part of the character. Right? Like that's part of what I know about him. He's a creepy guy staring at someone. Or he's a sweet guy who's not aware that he's gonna get caught being mildly creepy because he's busy analyzing two other people. And he's got some deceptive thinking, but because that thinking is so moment by moment, it seems like he might be offering something more accurate than he is. Yeah, when I think about um, his voyeurism um, in that moment, um, I think at one point in this story, um, the word loitering comes up. Yeah. And it comes up in another one of Calabata's stories that is very similar structurally to this one, um, um, where you know you have a character who's walking and then intensely observing two other characters, um, and it's an interesting word choice. Um, there are things about the observation that certainly um, are so intense in their scrutiny. Matthew, I like that word. Um, that um, they do feel creepy at the same time he's he seems so swept up in his observations um and the affect seems to be one of more like ex exhaustive specificity and um kind of unconvincing journalism yeah. <laughs> um, that the I, I don't know um part of why i wanted to pay attention to reliability is is for this reason um i think for me like matthew it's it's not especially important to me whether i trust the narrator or not in fact um often my feeling about that it is that it really doesn't matter that much but i do want to pay attention to like how that narration is working and yeah. the moments where, you know, I'm maybe reading a little quickly and trusting a physical description even, and then, like, slowing down and, like, well, is there causality wrapped into that, like, your shoe example that may not be there? Um, you know, it's, it's interesting in that it can change things a little bit in terms of the, your way of thinking of the work. Well, one thing I'll point out is that you had mentioned earlier that the clog is the girl's clog, but in the book it is just with a girl's clog. Yeah, no, you're right. Um, and so we don't know that, that it's hers. hers. Even, it could be another one, you're right. And if it's not hers, where did he get this? The <laughs> clog, <laughs> right? Like, the it, mystery it's a very, like, you know. Yeah. Part two. Um, so going, going back to... Um, the form of this story, because, I mean, it belongs to this collection of Calabatas, um, the palm of the hand stories, and, you know, I, I know that you two haven't spent time with that full collection, but um, I think Calabata has a particular way of writing a short piece. I tried to choose one that, you know, shows off some of his unusual moves in terms of approaching the short form. It's certainly not you know, the only one I'd recommend reading. Um, they're wonderful and all doing very different things. Um, there's a wonderful one that's structured just as a letter, um, like a two-page letter. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a book I'd highly recommend. Um, <clears throat> and, I mean, I think a book that surprises in its approach to the short form um, like we're saying, I don't think every short piece is concise or even diminutive. Um, I'm hoping that we can look at this story and um, pay a little more attention to its pacing, its shape, its structure, and how it's managing length. Um, where does it take its time and where does it move quickly, assuming that it does take its time and move quickly at times. Um, and maybe going back to the bamboo question, what exists outside this story's borders? Like, what is it held back? Yeah, I think this is, you know, I was looking over your questions before we had this conversation. I think this is <laughs> one of the harder ones for me to think <laughs> yes, about. I've listed like 10 things, yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think those things are slightly different in terms of its mm -hmm. shape, right? Like, 
I don't know what the occasion for this story is, other than the individual telling me the story is thinking about it. And what I know is that he stops, like, and he, he sees these two people, and then he has an encounter with these people, like, where he sees them and they've seen him back. And then he's thinking sort of forward into their lives based on his own kind of generalized speculations, right? Um, I think that's the, the sort of arc and the trajectory of the thing. I think the borders of that story are that, and I, I'm trying to remember if I have read this book end to end, I know I've read a lot of these stories, and I. What I do know is that, like, they are. I think Cowbot is not wrong to think in terms of like poetic impulse that they're highly image-based stories. That there's some kind of visual thing that happens in most of them that drives whichever narrator is narrating to kind of contain the story in the observation of something lovely, but often a little ephemeral. Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's my experience of it anyway. And I think that like what's outside the borders are like lots of things. Like even if you're, let's say you are in Japan in 1927 or 1928, let's say you know what this building is is the Hakuhin, right? Like, it's still described as, quote, a building that always closes at the same time in the evening, right? Um, and then the next description we get is the space between the Hakuhin and the night stalls. So we know that there's something happens in that building, right? Like, maybe you have an understanding if you're in that time and place of what that building does, right? But the narrator still has the impulse to tell you that it's a building and that it closes at the same time. It's mm -hmm. such a small... It's such a small detail and it's such a sort of like, you know, structurally fixated detail that I don't learn anything from it, I don't learn anything about the building, I don't learn anything about what goes on in the building, like what stops at the same time every evening, but the narrator feels compelled to tell me that it is a building, that the building closes, so presumably he's there, and that, right, like, that it closes in the evening, which is the time that most things close, or most buildings close. So I... I don't know, right? Like, I, I know that all of this happens for him at that time. I know that it leads him to thinking about this thing, but he also doesn't come to conclusions. I think what's outside of the story is why this is significant to this narrator, what the narrator is doing, right? So on and so forth. And I think that would be true even if I had a context of what this space looked like, mm -hmm. I would still ask myself, and what the like normal interaction of this space would be, I think I'd still be asking myself, why does he care? <laughs> you know, like, sure. and I, not in a bad way. I think I just, there's something about that framing that encourages me to think about the person, but maybe doesn't let me in beyond the way in which he mentally operates through the narrative. Yeah. I <clears throat> The first paragraph is basically scene setting and telling us, like, he's this person mm -hmm. that often goes to this building at night until it closes and does whatever he does inside that place. <laughs> and, like, this night, apparently, he's walking home and he sees something that interests him. And, like, that's the only thing I can think of for, like, the occasion. Right. Like, somehow it's interesting to him. <clears throat> and... Then he spends most of the story describing the glasses man and the firecracker girl and their little game, whatever their little game is. He takes time to ogle the girl uh, for a while, and uh, then he, we have the 
only like interaction between the two characters he's looking at and him, <clears throat> which is the girl suddenly looks up at one point and she involuntarily smiles at him and he does the same in return. And so like, I think he is like the, the reason to write this story, I guess, in my mind was that somehow he feels like he's stolen something from these people. And as Adam mentioned earlier, you know, uh, they're in a public setting, but it's kind of a private moment, even though they're in public, you know, and that can, we can argue that until the cows come yeah, home, yeah. you know. Um, but the narrator is worried that somehow he's taken something that was meant for the glasses vendor. Yeah. And, you know, he watches the glasses vendor's reaction. And, you know, some part of me thinks like, you know, the narrator is talking about how things should be in Japanese society at this time, right? The girl and this, old, this older man should not be uh, doing this together in between their stalls. Um, in fact, the girl should really get home with the protection of two men from her family. Um, and not be alone here with this other man and says nothing about himself really other than that like he stole a smile from this girl on accident even though he like very clearly like is standing there for quite some time in order to take down all these details and you know the the other thing is kind of like um while I'm well, I think, like, some things that Japanese society uh, has in place for, like, the proper etiquette, like, on the other hand, what if, you know, uh, these other things happened? Like, this man, like, seduces this girl and, like, bad things happen to her. Or, on the other hand, the girl shows her power and, like, puts it in this man's face and he's just, like, shocked and, like, leaves her alone. It's a very, like, you know, <clears throat> he's kind of riding those two edges, I think, within his telling of this particular story. Yeah. I think that's a, a hell of an interpretation <laughs> of the story. I, um, I, yeah, likewise, I agree. <clears throat> and, I mean, I think one thing I want to go back to a little bit um, that Matthew touched on is, is shape and pacing. Um, yeah. Matthew's not exaggerating that the, the attention to um, description and scene is heavy on the front end of this story. Like, what you get is this narrator stopping and watching these two characters and detailing their bodies in ways that are so precise that, um, you know, I had a similar feeling as a reader. Like, I was so busy trying to track the precision of it that it had the effect of, you know, actually helping me see the scene, but slowing me down in a way to take me out of feeling like I was there as a reader. Um, th there's a difference, I think. Um, and, I mean, if I've spent a lot of time thinking about what that does for me with this story, and um, I, I recently read um, George Saunders' book on... Um, Russian writers of A Swim in the Pond in the Rain, A Swim in a Pond in the Rain, I think it is. Um, and he talks about a Russian story, uh, um, Turgenev's um, called The Singing Contest, I want to say, I'm blanking on the title. Um, but the front end of that story is, is similar. It's um, a lot of description and it's framed as a contest immediately. So, I mean, with that story, we do have something that you expect to happen at the end of the story. With this one, you don't so much. The, the title, um, you know, points you to a smile that's going to happen, right? Um, but I think for me, one thing that ends up happening in terms of pacing, and I'd be curious to know if it, this was similar for you, is 
because the front end is slow and makes me work and takes me out of the scene a little bit as a reader, um, the ending really um, hits me harder, I think, um, because it, it feels like a sort of poetic little beer um, volta, I guess. Um, well, there are but not works. in the last few. <laughs> not in the last couple lines, but, you know, um, a long form volta. <laughs> well, there are the imaginative fireworks, you know, like right. uh, at the end. Uh -huh. But, that, you know, that was the whimsy I was kind of like pointing towards earlier. And our power also that you're pointing to. Yeah. No, I just, I think that you're, you're right in thinking that she does, he speculates that she has this incredible power to actually, he would like for her rather than to take off with this man or even to be walked home by her father or brother to light off all of the fireworks at once. Um, and I think that's obviously a little appealing to him as someone who's fixated visually that kind of stunning moment. Uh, but also it would be that kind of violent and beautiful response to anyone else's demands on her, whatever they are. Yeah, I mean, I think he has to do the thing at the end, the swerve in this particular story. <clears throat> I wouldn't make that argument about just any story. Um, but in this, if he doesn't do it, there's not much to think about. Because he's described things, things so heavily, like... While there is room to think about like the narrator and like what the narrator's doing and what's happening outside, like without showing some interiority of that particular narrator or moving past this little game that he espies on his way home, it would fall flat. And you know, that's not always the case. I think here it was a must. Otherwise the story is just, you know all right, we're watching these people, like, fuck around and waste some time outside their stalls, you know? And while that can be interesting, like, by swerving in this particular manner, it takes a turn emotionally and intellectually into more possibilities than the narrator allowed us previously. And, like... You know, one of the things is, um, you know, thinking more clearly about who these characters are based on their occupation, right? Like, at one point, he says, quote, if I may use the terms of your trade, speaking of the glasses <laughs> yeah. vendor, like, of course he can. He's telling the story. But, you know, uh, in his way, he's, he's, he's being funny. And he says, if I may use the terms of your trade, the spectacles of your heart are slightly clouded and out of focus. Right? Like, you don't get a good line <laughs> like that if you don't push farther than the situation. Mm. And, and I think that's an amazing line because, right, it's equating vision to the heart, which actually points to the man's, you know, want for this young girl in a way that also equates his livelihood um, in the story, right? And so this comes after these kind of descriptions of uh, the glasses stall at the beginning, right? Which is also a pretty funny description. It says, quote, at the optician stall, old age glasses, glasses for the nearsighted, tinted glasses, glasses for show with frames of gold, probably gilt, <laughs> Silver, gold and copper alloy, <laughs> steel or tortoise shell, binoculars, dust goggles, swimming goggles, magnifying glasses, and the like were ranged in rows. Right? And so, like, he's taking things that he's done before and, you know, overlaying them on the characters to make you consider certain things and actions that the characters do. Like, he talks about the optician 
Um, and we don't actually, we don't even know if he's an optician. He's just selling glasses, right? He's talking about the glasses vendor, um, you know, marking all these characters in the dirt and that he can keep going and mark down thousands and millions and like dig a hole through the center of the earth. And like the premise being like, if this game continues, the glasses vendor will somehow uh, make or lure the girl to fall into his trap, which is this hole of communication that supposedly our narrator thinks is bad for this girl, even though he has no idea what the man is writing on the dirt. He could just be drawing pictures. We don't know. Yeah, he could be conducting some kind of eye test with the girl, like I really, which is part of what is weird about it. All of the speculation in the story, including, right, like, I mean, you reading that reminds me, for me, the story is very much framed by the list of different kinds of, like, fireworks, right? Um, but there are these other lists like that that include things that probably guilt, right? Like, he's, he's the, he, the narrator, is using either experience or pure speculation in the way that, like, oh, she's probably thinking this, or he's probably doing it because of that, or whatever, that might be real knowledge or might be, because we don't know much about him, could be just him adding an ethos to his own character or hiding his lack of ethos behind listing things that anyone can see. But also, I think, Calbot is introducing us to this kind of interesting thing about maybe I'm giving too much credit because I, I like a lot of Calbot. I like this story, but like that there's there's something about those lists that are always sort of imperfect. The in that like there's something weird about a list to me of right, like the dust goggles mm -hmm. and like nearsighted glasses are in the same stall for some reason and maybe that's only weird to me because like I don't go to the like same place to get a pair of swimming goggles that I would to like you know get my vision correction lenses um, and that's maybe part of my own experience in imposing that onto that there's something imperfect about the list or the list doesn't contain Everything, to Matthew's point, we have to sort of burst out of it, even as, as he's trying to tie it in or explain it through the jargon of the spectacles of your heart. Yeah, I think um, two really interesting things happen on that first page, um, getting introduced to the narrator. So he, he comes out of this building that always closes at the same time, and one of the things that comes up is that um, he pays a lot of attention to the the size and width and length of spaces. Yeah. Um, and he says in, you know, articulating like where the night stalls are, where the building is, um, he says that the kind of space between the building and the night stalls seemed curiously wide so that I felt shy about walking down the middle of it. Um, I, I feel like this story, the, that moment isn't especially funny to me. Um, but then in that same paragraph, you get this long list of the goggles and the glasses back to back with a long list of the firecrackers that he's seeing. And what he says at the end of that is, but I wasn't looking at the firecrackers or the eyeglasses. At that point, I'm laughing a little as a reader. I'm like, well, how am I getting this list? Yeah. Um, and, you know, I mean, I think as a narrator, he, he's got this contradictory side to him where, you know, he's at once shy about walking in the middle of the road, but unabashed about watching other people um, more comfortable as, as a looker than um, someone who's being looked at. Although it also reflects the much creepier image of him that those other two are getting because he's while it's more vulnerable to be in the middle of the road, mm -hmm. he's probably, you know, this is me maybe overthinking like him, but actually shadowed by staying close to the building and away from them a little bit. Yeah, um, I, I imagine him shifting his position there as well. Um, 
let's um let's go to the relationship between the glass vendor and the firecracker girl. What do you guys make of it? I think we talked about it indirectly yeah. a lot that sure. um that what's tricky for me is that A, I'm seeing it through the the narrator's lens of the two of them, and he's fixated on, you know, the details of this girl, and some of this might be, like, clearer in sort of... Some I spectacles? S- yeah. <laughs> um, I, you know, I assume the original is written in kanji, and that, like, there also might be within that context, right? Like, one point her hair is described as, like, a cleft peach in quotation marks, quaff. And I, I have to imagine that there's a more direct term for that mm. that, like, Kawabata's original readers might have known. Interesting. I have no idea about that. I mean, it might also be him going, like, out of his way to really reach for specificity. Mm. It's the only time, I believe, in the entire story that anything's put in quotation marks like that. Yeah. Um, so I think there's, there's those elements, but my point is that, right, like this guy's looking at them so intently, but I think he's also putting an inferred romantic relationship onto this situation or a blossoming romantic mm-hmm. relationship, which is also the basis of how he receives the titular smile outside the night stall, that he feels like he stole it. Mm-hmm by, like, just being there and catching it because, you know, I guess in the way that the narrator's thinking about it, this girl has this buildup of a smile that is going to burst out in some kind of, like, you know, sexually ejaculatory way toward the, like, like, eyeglasses vendor that doesn't actually, but, like, bursts out at him just because she shocked him in the moment of being observed or recognizing that she's being observed. And I think that that's, that's such, I feel like that's what the narrator wants me to think about it. I think that's such a particular interpretation of that or even like an awkward smile or that a smile couldn't be, that if you had a buildup of a positive smile, you're kind of holding back in some demure way for a lover or potential lover even if that were true about these two people, I don't, I, I've spent a lot of time thinking about whether or not I believe the narrator's particular interpretation of the smile itself. And I think his interpretation is based on all these other details, which he's, he's trying to, mostly by watching the woman's body more than the man's. You see what the man is doing as he writes letters. There's a lot of description of the girl, how her arms are, how they hang, how her breasts like are and aren't moved in the kimono and all this kind of stuff, right? I I have no idea what to make of these two people. I don't know if this is a game they play every night. I don't know if he's just like showing the girls. Maybe she's like, you know, like you're here every day, but I can't see shit. Like, can you like test my eyes and help me find some glasses? And he's just, I mean, that's the one that I keep coming back to is a real plausible thing that they're doing. Maybe they're bored. It's the end of the night. Maybe they're flirting. Maybe, you know, the eyeglasses vendor is mute, but he can write. Like, I, I don't know. I like, I think so much is dependent on this idiosyncratic narrator and his idiosyncratic way Mm -hmm. of viewing it. And one of the things I lose in the sort of technical descriptions is anything like an ability to actually interpret what her body is doing, why it's doing, and what sort of would be flirtatious or not flirtatious. And part of that's because even if we're to believe him, some of the flirtation is cut off or the moment of moving past demureness toward flirtation is cut off. And... You know, there's no movement out of what's otherwise possible. So I I just, I don't, I wish I knew. I can tell you what I think he wants me to think. But I don't know that I have an actual interpretation. I mostly just have speculations. And I guess I, 
I kind of believe him, but I, I kind of feel wrong about believing him. Yeah, I mean, I think you're spot on. I think uh, the only way we can see these two is through the narrator. And the narrator lays his own thoughts on us while we watch these people and very specifically sexualizes the young girl. Uh, the peach, her breasts, right? Like these things are very specifically sexualized for him to make the points that he's making. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I, I don't think there's enough information otherwise to tell <clears throat> exactly what the relationship is. And I think, you know, the things that you've said uh, as possibilities you know, cross my mind. I've said some of the same things already. Um, I think it's it's more about um, considering how we pass judgment on people um, in a moment um, and what it makes us feel at the same time, like both things. Like, you know, that's, it's, there's so much, happening in the world, right? Like, that's why we have generic things to say, like, generic things. And, like, he tries to get as specific as he can without, like, you know, coming out and, you know, actually saying something to these two people and changing the situation. Yeah. And when he does change the situation, situation with the smile that is, you know, given and returned, he leaves. Because in some way, he, he I think, feels like He's like this field analyst. He's out in the wild, like, <laughs> documenting things. And he's like, well, now that I've ruined that, I have to move on and I will take down my notes and, like, that is that. And I will speculate on, you know, what may or may not happen. Yeah. I think also I, I just want to note that one thing that stood out to me was that he actually, I mean, in the end, when he's doing his speculating, he speaks to the individuals he's watching. Glasses vendor, exclamation point, right? Your displeasure is understandable. Probably you did not know it, but the girl's blushing and hiding her face with her sleeve must have been on your account, right? That's part of how he's interpreting that this is like a romanticized situation. But also for some reason the glasses vendor doesn't know it, right? This, this that internal contradiction stuff that's going on a little bit. Because a little smile that bloomed fleetingly outside the night stall was stolen from you by me. Of course, even though you glanced at each other, you were so intent on what you were doing that your faces were almost expressionless. So the girl's smile ought to have been given to you. If only I hadn't been looking, you probably would have given the girl the same smile in return. Da da da. Uh, right, like, he then does, right, like, say, but there is tomorrow evening and the evening after that. So not only is there the interpretive fact, but also in his field analyst way, I think there's something about love that he does and doesn't understand, or flirtation that he does and doesn't understand, that somehow, if all of these conditions were true, that that moment is just replaceable, and that he was just an observer whose only effect was to momentarily steal a smile and all of this picks up identically thereafter. That may be true if he's right about all of those conditions. It might be that, like, you know, the creepy guy standing in the shadows stalking you in some horrifying way is the thing that makes the girl go, this is an unlucky situation to be hanging out with his class. There's so many, like, <clears throat> infinite possibilities. I mean, he's apologizing, saying sorry, because he does believe himself. And I think that's evidenced by that interaction more so than... I think that, like, those internal contradictions, those very determined assumptions, and those apologetic ways of saying it, all of that adds up to me to say that, like, this is a guy who's, like, done something kind of weird because of who he is, and then he's applying all this other stuff to both think out and resolve it for himself a story that has anything particular to say about these two people or who they actually are. Yeah, I think that's one of the unusual tricks of the narration. And, you know, I mean, 
having, I don't know, I guess as someone who reads a lot of short stories, I, I don't come across ones very often that look anything like this one structurally, where, you know, you get a narrator who you have almost no access to and no information about. And then in the final part of the very short story, you shift to direct address, where the narrator's kind of like speaking to particular characters who you only have access to through that narrator. So, I mean, it's a very, like, controlling kind of narration, um, a very, like, intense trick. Um, and, you know, certainly a surprise to me stylistically. Um, what exactly does the narrator express in his final addresses? Um, what is he telling these vendors to your mind? Um, I think part, part of why I ask that to give a little context is um, I think as a reader I get so, so surprised by the term and so excited by it that um, it, for me it was more on second read that I started paying more attention to what was actually getting communicated there and thinking about that. And, in relation to the story that came before. Yeah, I think, like, I want to say this neutrally, or I want to say this, like, I don't think my language is going to sound as, like, neutral or sound as sort of enthusiastic as I am about the end. I think that, like, you know, I might be overstating to say that we don't learn anything about, or the story doesn't have anything to say about the two people that are being observed. I just think that if you had to pick who the story belongs to, it's the narrator and not the people who... The oh, certainly. Going at. I agree. And I don't think that's... Um, personally, I don't think that's to the story's detriment either. And I think, you know, it's... It, it presents a new possibility uh, yeah. in terms of storytelling, to my mind. Yeah, and I think that in one way that that's indicated is that what he actually has to say at the end... I mean, it's not only calling out to them in direct address, glasses vendor, right? Like, exclamation point, firecracker girl, exclamation point, left-handed girl, exclamation point, right? That I think there's also an indication that this is a... I mean, it kind of diatribes at the end, right? Like, mm -hmm. And it's a stirring diatribe, and that's what I mean. I don't have a better word than, than diatribe, right? Like, he's just... What's actually happening is this guy has walked away from this situation and he's not engaging any feeling like guilt in a direct sense. He's sort of pontificating at these people how they should think as if they should take his advice or his opinion or as if he knows either one of them and what's actually happening between them, right? Um, and it's... You know, but it becomes this kind of stirring, really sort of riveting thing. Like, I, I like his ideas. I like the idea of all the fireworks going off at once. I, I like that there is a kind of apologetic part of him that wants to say, sorry, I stole your smile, dude. <laughs> and, like, the, that person who can say, sorry, I stole your smile, dude, also is like, hey, man, like, firecracker girl, I'm not sure that it's a good thing for you to go off with the glasses vendor. And I think Matthew rightfully points out that that could be a really conservative impulse. Or it could also be like, a just like honest, like, hey man, I don't know. And I don't know, this, like there's a, I think it's, a, it's this kind of riveting diatribe, but it's really about what he's, the way he's able to access those people and what he's trying to tell them without ever having to say to himself like, I'm being a creep, or like, I don't know what's going on. Like, he needs some kind of connection that isn't there for him, and he's trying to explain it to himself, but it's coming up in these, these really remarkable metaphors and moments, and, and, you know. Everything in the story is based on sight. The glasses vendor is for eyesight. The fireworks you appreciate with sight, obviously sound is involved and smell can be too, but predominantly sight, we wait till the night yeah. to fire the firecrackers so that we can see them. Sure. 
um, the game they play is looking in the dirt and, you know, describing something with a clock. Um, and finally, the story is told from the point of view of sight only, basically, right? Like the narrator is looking and describes everything based on sight. There is actually uh, no dialogue, right, throughout the entire story, right? So it's all based on vision. And, you know, I think one of the, the, the things that is being said based on that is like, even though you can perceive things properly, rightly, you can catalog things, it doesn't mean there's an understanding, yeah. right? There's, <clears throat> even if you are correct, it doesn't mean you understand fully, yeah. right? So it's, I think it's, it's about, it's showing like what is possible with storytelling based purely on, you know, vision and like following that vision using logic both from the narrator's perspective and from the reader's perspective. Yeah. And, and from there, like, you know, he blows it up along with the fireworks at the end and says, you know, I, I, as Adam said, you know, I, I don't know. I could be wrong. I could be right. Does it matter? Yeah. I think, um, in, in prepping to discuss this with you guys, I actually read a little Susan Sontag this morning, um, excerpts from her book on photography and um you know some of what she's unpacking in that book is you know we look at a photo of you know people in a situation that seems dire but maybe we don't know what it is about the situation that's dire and what it is about their lives and um you know focusing on like the ways in which photos can work on us um, without having haha the full picture um, I think a thing I love about this story is I, I think it's very much engaged with those kinds of ideas about the limits of narration and the limits of seeing other people and interpreting what it is that they're up to um, and, you know, Matthew, I think you're so right to point us to sight. Um, <clears throat> a thing I, I really love um, that, you know, I think all of us knowing this story um, was a little difficult to, like, contextualize on the fly is, is thinking about um, that moment where in the direct address, um, the narrator's speaking to the glass, the glasses vendor. You know, he begins glasses vendor and then... Um, after a while says, if I may use the terms of your trade, the spectacles of your heart are slightly clouded and out of focus, but there is tomorrow evening and the evening after, write down thousands, hundreds, and thousands of characters in the dirt until you reach the center of the earth. Um, some of what the narrator is responding to in that moment is, you know, he's been observing these two characters and the the glasses vendor is writing all these characters, um, maybe that the girl, the firecracker girl can read, maybe not. But when they're looking up at each other, um, the narrator believes that they're not seeing each other very well, that they're kind of going right back to the writing. Um, so the smile feels significant because it's a moment where the two characters are in the present and there's this exchange and you know, I mean, I think the story is is toying a lot with that, like what we know about an ephemeral moment, what we don't, and um, you know, the limits to which we can we can and can't see into each other's lives sure. and hearts. Yeah. Should we end there? Yeah. Okay. My sparkler has gone out. <laughs> Thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you. For Thanks. Those.